The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Are you having conversations with clients about retirement? Are they asking how much money they'll need? Are they worried they'll run out? We're proud to introduce the new North Retirement Space on Ensemble, featuring Q&As with economists, webinars with product innovators, and unfettered access to retirement specialists to support your advice. Join the conversation today with North, a better way for retirement. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Billy Norman today. Billy, thanks for joining me. You're at Link Wealth Group and uh, all over TikTok and a few other places, so i uh, Nice to have a chat with you. Yeah, thanks, James. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining me this this morning. It's a Monday morning as we're as we're recording this one. We're gonna have a bit of a chat uh, around social media marketing. I reached out to Billy to ask him if he if he'd be on the on the podcast, and uh, we're going to get into the topic of social media marketing and your kind of experience and how you got into it, how it's going for you, what you're using to to do it, all of those kind of things. But like we tend to do before we. Before we get into that, just like to hear a bit of a bit of your story. So, zero at Link Link Wealth Group, uh, you're here in in Melbourne as am as am I. Um, maybe let's give what's, what's a bit of your background. So, I guess what are you up to now at Link Wealth Group, and and then and then a bit of your background. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, yeah, look, I started with with Link Wealth about four years ago, <clears throat> and so at that time I started with no clients. So, sort of starting afresh, uh, had to build a client base. Um, so the first couple of years there, that was really my focus. And then about a year ago, I probably got to the point where I'm, you know, 100 clients. So getting to that full client load. Um, so the next stage of what I'm doing now is I'll keep building that, but I'm also, I've got an associate advisor who's working with me. And so once they'll do their PY year, once that's done, hopefully I'll then transition a, a big chunk of my clients across so I'm just getting to that point where I've got the full client book that I'm looking after now and just trying to get the that balancing act right of looking after clients, chasing down some new business, and then personally wanting to focus more on you know, mentoring team members and bringing through associate advisors and so on. Yeah. So did you join Link as an advisor? Were you... Were you- what, 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 yeah. Did you join as an advisor? Did you join as an associate? What did you do as an advisor? Yeah, so I was uh, my previous role. I was a financial advisor, and I had clients there. And I decided that wasn't where I was before. That wasn't going to be my long term home. Um, so I met up with with Steve Sloan, who's the who's the uh, founder of Link Wealth, and he just acquired a couple of books. And so he was hiring. He was looking for advisors who could just hit the ground running and jump in and take on all these new clients and transition them in, them into the business. So I joined as an advisor. But yeah, started you know started from zero and just had to get on the phones and speak to all these people that we we wanted to onboard as as clients. Yep, and 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 prior to prior to joining Link, like what you did, how how many years were you advising? Like what what was your like kind of what was your pathway into being an advisor? What what did you do, what did you do to get up to? Yeah, a very long and slow pathway, James. I was, oh, I was a power planner for like ten years. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, so I like I finished high school in in two thousand. Then I started working in my dad's accounting business, and then they started doing some advising, and that's how I was exposed to it. Gotcha. I, you know, initially, I was studying IT, and then I was like, "No, nah, I don't like this. I like the share market and what's happening at dad's business." Uh, so that's how I started in the industry, and you know, did the the old school trajectory of sort of ad- administration, and then mm. junior power planning, senior power planning. And then it's sort of, a, it's a long story, but essentially around, you know, we had the GFC around 2008 and the business, I was a, probably about to become an advisor what, back then and the business I was in ran into all sorts of trouble. Oh, uh, did they? Yeah, just uh, just a lot of clients with margin loans and some financial products that didn't work out too well. Yeah. Um, so I left that business and I had a bit of a like rethink of my whole career at that point. I almost left, left financial yeah. advice altogether back then. 
And then I decided, no, I'll stick with it. Um, I just need to become more educated before I'm going to be an advisor. So I went back to uni, finished a financial planning degree, did CFP, did para planning for years. <laughs> so were you, were you para planning whilst you were at uni and, and doing your CFP? Yes. You spent, yeah, yeah, it was. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so initially I was just a standard full-time para planner in a business. Mm. Then I started, then I found out about contract para planning, like doing it remotely. Yes. Um, so I, I did that while I was studying, which worked out really well because I can just sort of come in and out of the office a bit, do some work from home um, and sort of turn up and down the hours as I needed to with study. Yeah. Uh, then I finished I uh, finished the degree and then I had a bit of a like early midlife crisis around 30 years old and um, I went and joined some friends uh, to do, do a couple of ski seasons. Oh, did you? Yeah. So yeah. I did 30 years old. I went and did three ski seasons back to back. While I was contract power planning, so your contract power pl- like what you were in somewhere in overseas, contract power planning, skiing during the day and writing plans at night, kind of thing. Yes, <laughs> <That's crazy. laughs> I did it in I did Japan, New Zealand, Japan because it was like similar time zones. Yeah, and the advisors didn't. They don't care. They were just emailing me. No one really spoke to me. I needed really to come into an office, so they didn't even know where I was. Yeah, and I was just charging per SOI. And were you working for yourself then, contract para planning, or through like mm. a, a para planning group? Or how are you dealing? How are you doing that? Uh, both, both. Yeah. I was just getting work wherever I could. So businesses yeah. I'd worked for in the past, I was just emailing them saying, "Do you have any spare plans you need doing? Because I'm doing this now." And I was sending them like a pricing list. So I was doing some direct, and then to get more work, I was also going through some of the contractor, the bigger groups. Yeah. Um, or one of them was Haley Knight. I did did a bit of work for her at one point. Yeah. Yeah, okay. You may know of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. So what were you doing like the ski seasons? Were you were you just skiing or were you instructing? Like were you were you working on the ski fields as well or what were you up to? Um, I was there with a few friends and one of them uh, got a full time instructing job. Uh, I tried to get work there, but pretty hard in Japan with a with a uh, uh, tourist visa and um, and no ski instructing experience. Yeah. So I tried to get some work there. I got a I got a job on a bar for a little bit, but that was like only for a few weeks. The rest of the time I was just riding SOAs and then I was yeah. just um, just snowboarding with my with my mates pretty much. How long like how long a stint did you stay in Japan for? I did like a full winter, like four months in Japan. Then I came back to Melbourne and um one of the groups I was working for, they had heaps of work, so I went into their office for a couple of months. Yeah. Then I had some friends in Wanaka in New Zealand and they said, you can stay at our place for a couple of months if you want. So I jumped yeah. at that and then I did Wanaka in New Zealand. Yeah. And then after that, I just wasn't quite done yet. So I went back to Japan and uh, I found some way to live with the contacts I'd met the previous season. Was it the, so it was the same group of people like New, Japan, New Zealand, back to Japan or was it like different people? Initially, like what prompted it was I had uh, two friends, uh, two couples and they decided they were just going to sell all this stuff, quit their jobs, and just travel for a year or two. Yeah. And part of it was doing a full ski season. Yeah. Um, and I had just finished my study, and I didn't have a partner. And I thought, yeah. And I started doing this contract power planning, so I just thought, well, I'll just join them. Like, yeah. They have no reason not to. So initially, that first Japan season was a group of us, and we all had to work quite hard to find out where we could live and if we could get jobs there, et cetera. Then after that, I came back to Melbourne. Then I had my, my friends who lived in Wanaka, so I went and yeah. joined them. And then to do Japan again, I just reconnected with some of the people I'd met in the ski resort the first time around. Yeah, right. And we all arranged some accommodation and did it again. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> and then I got really sick of the very inconsistent cash flow of being yeah. a contract paraplanner. <laughs> and I thought, no, that's it. I, I need to get a normal job now. So you yeah. sort of got my fill of doing that and then... um then came back, you know, went into a share house, got a full-time job. Yeah. But okay, if I'm going to be an advisor, now's the time. But at stage, I've been paraplaning for years and years. Yeah. And I was pretty sick of it. So um, I just thought, yeah, I've got to either be an advisor or do something else altogether. Yeah, it's it. like that's a so, that, that's a fair length of time. You often you often find people, you know, if, you, if you're in paraplaning for a while, tend to just be like a career paraplaner. That's what they want to do. You know, for, if you've talked up 10 years in it, that's... Uh, that's a fair length of time to to then to, to move out of it. So how did how did you find moving out of paraplaning to being an advisor? How did that transition go for you? 
Yeah, good question. Because after 10 years of power planning, I thought I knew everything about financial advice. Mm. I discovered I knew very little. <laughs> <laughs> so I got, you know, I'd, I hardly had to speak to anyone, when I was, especially when I was power planning overseas. I didn't cool. talk to anyone. I was just sitting on city in Excel and Word documents and X plan and, and uh, emails and like I wasn't even talking to anyone. So now mm. all of a sudden you're sitting in front of a client and I thought, well, I know all the strategies and products back to front, so I should be fine. I found out that wasn't the case at all, you know, especially yeah. with a new client. They don't care if you, you know, they don't care how good your technology is. Yeah. Um, so I really, it, it was a lot tougher than I thought it would be. Mm. Did you have any, did you have like, wherever you ended up working, did you just get, did you just become an advisor straight away or did you have some like mentoring going on? Like it sounds like you're doing some mentoring now with people that you're working mm. with, but had, did you have anything at that time or did you, you just jump straight into being an advisor? Well, yeah, it was really hard. And even yeah. the business I was with, they didn't really have a, a process for for someone like me because, yeah. you know, you get to being a senior power planner, you're earning a pretty good salary. You don't want to go back to like a zero, you know, junior advisor mm. <laughs> starting salary. Yeah. So how do you do that transition? Like if you, unless you want to take a huge pay cut. So essentially I applied for a job, um, it was through one of the contacts I'd made in doing my contract power planning. Hmm. And they said, we really need a good power planner here. And I said, well, I don't want to be a power planner. Hmm. <laughs> and they said, okay, well, if you if you can come here, you know, start here really quickly, we'll pay you a good salary, sort out our power planning issues. If you can then outsource, if you can then find someone else to do the power planning work, we'll then make you a financial advisor. Oh, so, so you get to come in and then also find someone to do the power planning work off the back of yes. Like you would have had a lot of contacts in power planning by then anyway, doing it for as long as you did. Yeah. yeah. So, and obviously I was a big fan of outsourcing and at that point, because that's what yeah. I'd done on the other side. Mm. So I ended up um, offshoring it, like using one of the bigger offshore groups at the time. Yeah. Okay. And that was very, that was quite challenging in this business because yeah. I hadn't done it before. Yeah. Um, so it took a while, like it took like a year and a half, really. Like initially I just had to get through the backlog of plans I had. Then I had to start to figure out how I was going to make myself redundant doing these plans. Yeah. Um, they had another power planner there. So that, that helped, you know, he was there. Um, uh, then I had to try and outsource as well. And yeah, I eventually got there. It took about a year and a half. Uh, be, I became an authorized representative finally and, um, uh, they had an insurance advisor there who left the business, so there was this massive book of of in, mostly insurance clients. Mm. So I, I just started meeting with them, and you know, let's catch up and look at your policies type yeah. thing. Uh, that was it was really challenging, but that, that's how I started. Yeah, what a story! That's incredible. It's a, how how did you like how long and how long into being an advisor did you think that like you you started to get the hang of like needing to talk to people, as, as you said, like run, running those meetings. How, how long did that, do you think that took you? It's it's like the importance of a mentor, I think, was what I discovered because initially I was left a fair bit to my own devices and I found that I found it really hard. Like I was okay talking to people, yeah. but trying to, if you've got all these people who have insurance, these clients who have insurance policies and that's the only relationship they've ever had with the business to try and talk to them about a retirement plan or investing or something it was it was really tough um transitioning them mm. um so i said initially it was really hard uh then then it got to the point i did that for a while and then one of the one of the older advisors there he was eyeing off retirement so he started transitioning his you know his full clients to me i not risk only yep my full retire retirees and pre-retirees and stuff like that so that's when i really started to to get into proper advising mm. Um, so I did that for a while and then, yeah, without going into all the reasons and, and so on, I decided that business wasn't my long-term home mm. and then started Link Wealth. And then that's when, since I've started Link Wealth Group, that's where, you know, my progress started and things started moving really quickly. Yeah. I, still had, I, had, yeah. I did a podcast with Steve a few weeks back and he was he was talking a lot about this, this kind of training program that you have for people in, internally, that there's a whole lot of the mentoring going on to um to to help everyone so yeah so so then you so you 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 four years at at link you started with zero clients did the the in in the beginning was your job to try and the kind of help 
work with the new clients that Steve has mentioned. Steve had just bought a couple of client books from where, wherever they were bought from. Was was it in the beginning you were just trying to deal with those new clients that that had been acquired by the firm? Yes, yeah. So it was like you know not cold calling, very very warm calling. So it was clients who had an advisor who mm. decided to to retire or leave. Uh, so we're calling them and saying, hey, we are, we are new advisors, let's catch up and, you know, have an initial chat and and see, you know, see what, what we can do for you. Mm. Um, so it was just on the phones and then that was right at the start of the pandemic as well. So <laughs> <laughs> it was like... GFC <laughs> and, then you, and then you walk into the pandemic. Uh, at Linkwell, February, just before before COVID and yeah. we were 100% client-facing meetings and um, calling all these clients that, you know, their previous advisor usually went to their house, you know. Yeah. So I'm calling all these people and for the first month I'm making a million calls and going to people's houses and then all of a sudden we're stuck at home. I'm thinking, oh, shit, how am I going to do this? <laughs> so yeah, it, was, it was tough, did, but it, we, got, we got through it. How did, I've, never, I've never really had a, a good chat with anyone that's done that. Like, how, do you, how did the clients react to... You're calling up, say, "Hey, I'm Billy. We, you know, we new new advisors. I would imagine those clients have been communicated to in some way prior to you, know, you and anyone else from Link giving them a call to say that their previous advisor re- retired or was selling the business or whatever the circumstances were. How were how receptive were the clients to you giving them a call and then meeting up with you and and and, and that kind of process? How receptive were they to that? Yeah, good question. Like the majority were fine. Um, yeah. Okay. Most of them had had an advisor for a long time. Um, and as you know, like advising, say, 10 years ago was, you know, not, not so strict in terms of having full reviews every single year mm. and uh, going into an office and sitting there for an hour and a half. So it was a bit more, they were used to quite a casual approach, like their advisor calling them just randomly out of the blue and then yeah. <laughs> coming over to their house. Yeah. Um, so the first meeting, most of them really liked the first meeting because we were way more structured than what they were mm. used to in the past. And, you know, they might have had an advisor they'd had for 20 years and they had someone fresh, you know, with more energy coming in and yeah. giving them a fresh perspective on how everything's set up. Uh, so most most people were, liked it. Mm. Um, ch- challenging coming in and, you know, as you can imagine, charging a lot more than what the previous advisor did. Yeah. Uh, and some of these were, were back from the, you know, old grandfather commission days and stuff like that. So yeah. the fee structure was always an interesting conversation. But, mm. If you came in with enough energy and new ideas, and yeah, and they could see they were going to be looked after, then most yeah, most clients were were happy. Yeah, yeah, we we find a we want a similar kind of thing, and you know, you're you're about to go through it with your you know, associate advisor to doing professional year and so forth. We often find a similar kind of thing when we um, you know, transition clients to to other advisors within within the business, as you mentioned. You know, client base gets to a certain level, and then you. You might need to introduce a new advisor. Quite often, we find that things then happen after that. Like they, they might then refer their friend, or you know, coincidentally, they're downsizing their house. And like there's, there's activity that comes. We find from just transitioning the some of the clients onto a different advisor. So all of a sudden, yeah, there's fresh ideas, a fresh face, you know, more, more energy, maybe in those meetings than what what they may be used to. And the fresh face makes a big chunk. Change to things. Um, yeah. So, why don't we have a bit of a chat about the social media uh, stuff now? So, you've you know you've four years into working at Link. You're seeing you know, it sounds like you've you know successfully transitioned a, a whole lot of clients from a from a previous advisor through you know that, that acquisition process that's happened into into your your looking after them. Now, what do you? So, you know, there's, there's a lot written about, I oh, advisors should be on social media, you should be posting on LinkedIn or Instagram or, or, or whatever, that, that, that happens all the time. What was the catalyst for you to start to put yourself out there online? Where did that start for you? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't off my own back. Yeah. Um, yeah firstly, Steve Sloan, the, the uh, main director of Link, he's always been keen on marketing. Um, and uh, up until a couple of years ago, I hadn't found anything that really worked too well. Um, and at that time, we brought in Celia Polking on. I think she's been on this podcast oh, yes, before. Yes, yeah. Uh, she at that time she was a, a LinkedIn specialist. Um, she told us very explicitly to start talking to the camera and filming it and putting it up on on LinkedIn. Yep. 
And she gave us a basic structure for that. And she said, you know, between one minute and three minutes, four minutes, absolute maximum. Um, and she ran us through her program at the time, all the advisors at Link Wealth. And we all agreed as a group, everyone will upload one video per week for the next 12 weeks. Uh, it was really hard at first. <laughs> and it's not something, it's not something I ever thought I would do. I yeah. <laughs> film myself talking and put it up on social media. Um, so it was very awkward at first. It was difficult uh, coming up with ideas and, you know, trying to do it without doing 12 takes and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but we did it and then we started to see some results and that encouraged us to keep doing it. And that, yeah, that's how it all started really. Yeah, right. And so where are you, where are you all putting videos now? Where, where are you posting them now? Yeah, so that was, when was that? That was probably almost three years ago now um, yeah. that we started doing that on LinkedIn uh, did that for a year or so, got some good results, um, and then started just reading about TikTok. And I thought it's uh, maybe it's worth a look. So I put it on my phone, jumped on there, looked for financial advisors, found you, <laughs> James, <laughs> and pretty much no one else at that point. Yeah. Actually, I don't think I found any other financial advisors on there um, and saw how much traction you were getting. And I thought, well, okay, I better start posting some videos up here too. Yeah. And yeah, very quickly saw massive results from TikTok. So, what do you can you quantify what you mean by results? LinkedIn, TikTok. What do you, like? What are you? Yeah, are, are you measuring that in, in some way? What what does what does results mean? Results means people watching the content, and mm-hmm. the real results is when they reach out to you and say, "I need advice," or "I saw you talking about X." Yep, I'm interested in that. Can we have a chat? And then that increasingly leading to to full fee paying clients. Yes. Okay. And and you're seeing that from both LinkedIn and from TikTok. Yeah, so over the last 12 months it's been tons of business from TikTok. Uh, okay. I think about probably 80% of my new business has come from TikTok. Yeah. Right. Um a handful from LinkedIn. Yep. Um but because what we've found is the longer you do this, the longer you put content up every week and build an audience, the stronger and the stronger and stronger the leads become because they're often people who have been watching your videos for a year. Yes. So by the time they reach out and by the time they speak to you, they've already decided they want to be a client. Yeah. <laughs> um, so powerful, isn't it? They're very powerful, very different to the old school, you know, say cold calling or something like that. Yeah. Um, just very, very warm leads. They've already seen you talk. So there's already some level of trust and they want to be clients and yeah. they want to, yeah. So, that's what I mean by by results. Amazing. So, how do you see? So you mentioned at the start when, when you first started, you did your twelve week thing on LinkedIn, you know, finding ideas and, and so forth was was difficult. Do you have any? Do you have a bit of a process with that? Like you know, you've you've been doing videos for a few years now. I imagine it gets a little bit easier with time. But what do you? How do you come up with ideas to talk about? Yeah, good good question. Um, it is hard at times and. It's interesting because when you become a financial advisor, or certainly I never thought there would be much of a creative element to it, uh, but coming up with ideas for social media, there is a big creative element to it. And um, like, I'm a big fan of stand-up comedy. Yeah. And I know if you're a stand-up comic, as you're walking around all day, you're actually looking for ideas in every little interaction you have. And there's an element of that to it. Like you're... It gets to the point if you if you're creating content regularly, where your your mind is always looking for ideas, and you'll sit, you know, you'll be speaking to a client, and they'll say something that gives you an idea for content. Yes. Um, so the more you do it, and the longer you do it, the easier it becomes that aspect, because you start to become wired to thinking of ideas. Yeah. Um, but when you first start out, it's hard. And the best way we came up with to come up with ideas was like a group, old school, you know, group brainstorming type session. Um, that, was, that was all of you in the office would, would come up with ideas together. Yeah. Well, initially we were doing that program with Celia. So she yes. was really helping us with content. Uh, and then we started, you know, just more and more frequently having discussions at the office about ideas. Yep. Um, you know, you see something in the news, something in the financial review, or, um, you know, if you follow, say, some American or British financial advisors, you can get some inspiration there and see what they're doing. Hmm. Yeah, so just looking around for those ideas, uh, but then you then you discover, yeah, you know, what do people want to see? Well, if you, you can tell client stories, like you can explain to people what you are doing, 
as an advisor for clients and you can give them specific case studies. Yes. Um, and as you know, that works really well because then some people out there see that and they're like, well, that's similar to my situation. I want I want a strategy like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's, so yeah, that's, that's one, of the, one of the most powerful ways to do content, I think. I notice you on your TikTok, you do some with like a beer. You are... Uh... I don't know. You'll get a beer of the week or whatever it is, and and do a video. How how, how have they go? How do they go for you? Yeah, that, that was interesting. Like that was when we were working with Celia, and I said to her, I said to her, I've I've got an idea of just like reviewing, yeah, reviewing a craft beer and then packaging that up with a finance tip. I said, is that allowed? Because I never noticed anyone drinking on LinkedIn. <laughs> like, is that okay? And she's she's like, yes, definitely, anything to get attention. And I thought, you know, right. So then I spoke to Steve, the boss. <laughs> I said, "Do you mind if I drink a beer on social media?" And he said, "Does Celia think it's a good idea?" And I said, "Yep." He said, "Yeah, go for it." <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's how it sort of started. Mm. And um, it's funny, like when I did that, the first few weeks that I did it, uh, I think I ended up with a couple of new clients pretty quickly off Facebook because there are people who already sort of knew me from yeah. the past, you know, some past job or whatever school or something and they saw me opening a beer and that just grabbed their attention and um so a few a few like old friends and stuff like that became clients because of that it just like it's just it's showing people more more of of you more that that's is obviously an interest of yours if you you know got the craft beers and you're talking about them that's obviously an interest of yours and as much as someone will see your strategy and go oh that look that sounds a bit like my situation i i, I want some help like that People are going to connect with that too. I'm sure there's people that come in and want to talk to you about the craft beers and oh, by the way, they you know this, that, and the other thing for financial advice. But that's a yeah, it's, it's a kind of some common ground, and yeah, I'm not surprised that it works for you. So, what do you do in terms of the 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 actual physical recording of the videos? Like, what do you what equipment are you using? How are you how are you setting up that? Yeah, sure. So I don't have any equipment. It's just all done on an iPhone. Yep. Do you, hey, you have a microphone or anything, or just, or just literally just you pull out your phone and record it? That's it. Yes, just my phone. The only equipment I'll sometimes use is you know the the ring light, like the Safi yeah. ring light type yeah. thing. You can get you know the Anko brand ones, <laughs> the Kmart ones. Yeah, I've got the Kmart like ones, fifteen dollars yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've got a big one at work that's on a tall stand, so you can put your phone in the holder thing and stand in front of it, and the ah, yes. pretty yeah, that makes the lighting nicer. Yeah. And I've got a small one at home, um, which I use for client meetings as well. Yep. Just so you look okay on camera. Yep. Um, but that's it, just an iPhone. So initially I was just recording them on the phone and then trying to get them onto LinkedIn, which was quite cumbersome. As soon as I started using TikTok, I mean, one of the reasons it's so successful and so powerful is the video editing tool in TikTok is incredible and it's really easy to use. Mm. And, you know, it's the point as you would know, James, so it gets to the point where sometimes you can create, edit, and upload a video within like five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just so good. And then once you've done that, you can use that video to re- and repurpose it for LinkedIn or Facebook or any of the other platforms. So you're, so you're recording it straight into the TikTok app. You open up the TikTok app, you put, it, you, you put your camera there in front of you, press record, crack the beer open, and, and have a chat, whatever you're talking about. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And then the main editing is really just snipping out all the... You're going to snip out the millennial pause. We had yeah. it today. <laughs> I didn't even know what that was until it's, I saw it on TikTok like, and it comes up with the comes up with that blue highlighted comment. I'm like, oh, yeah, actually, I'm doing this all the time. <laughs> yeah, so for those who don't know the millennial pause, you need to watch out for this if you're recording these videos. If you click record and then wait a couple of seconds and then start speaking, people who are younger than millennials call that the millennial pause. Like It's almost like you're pressing record and you're waiting for the... Yeah, giving time for the app to start working, the video to start recording before you talk. Um, so what you can do is record the video and then just edit out the first one or two seconds. So as soon as someone scrolls onto that video, you're just talking straight away. Yeah. So you just edit it to edit out the quiet bits or any bits where you're sort of rambling or anything like that and just make it snappy. And then there isn't too much more editing that you really have to do. Beautiful. And yeah, as you said, with your, with your results before, it's it's clearly... It's clearly working for you. Uh, you know, it's a new, new, new clients is the, I guess, is the whole, the whole purpose behind it. So it sounds like having a bit of fun, creative outlet with it at the same time. Yeah, exactly. And you just, uh, I think one of the, once you get into doing that, one of the challenges is not getting carried away where you just, 
you know, it's more fun making videos than it is writing up a meeting note or something. So <laughs> I, I struggle with that too. I'm like, oh, I really, I'd like to just sit here and make TikTok videos talking about stuff, not, uh, yeah, not the having to do the wrap up from client meetings and file notes <laughs> and emails and all the rest of it. The, uh, the, the videos are, are a little bit more fun. Yeah. That's, a, so that's good. And what are, so what are your plans moving forward from here? You mentioned at the start, you training up an associate advisor. You'll hand over some clients. Yeah, what's uh, what's the next few years in a little plan for you? Yeah, interesting question. It's, yeah, I mean, the, the group I'm with, Link Wealth Group, we're growing pretty quickly. Uh, we've got five associate advisors now hmm. and five senior advisors. So there'll be lots of associates to work with and mentor and train up. And then that will allow me to also decide sort of what sort of client book I want for myself, what size, what type of clients. Yes. Um, so there's that process. Then there's certainly the marketing will, will keep evolving as you know, especially like at TikTok's been amazing over the last year or two in terms of getting new business and building an audience. But these apps are always changing. True. Um, the algorithms are always changing and people's behavior is changing. So we're really keen as a, as a group to evolve our marketing um, and that might be, you know, doing podcasts or changing the way we we put out content, um, looking at the other platforms and all that sort of stuff. So a lot of work on marketing, a lot of work with associates, um, and just really trying to be at the forefront of whatever direction financial advice is is heading. Mm. Sounds like a sounds like a great business to be part of. This as Steve was on a a few weeks ago. You're doing some really interesting things, well and truly. Like well and truly at the forefront of that, there's not that many, not that many businesses. Like you know, there's there's a whole lot of businesses out there that are still struggling with a basic website, let alone trying to put the camera in front of their face and talk about a client story. Um, yeah, you're just so far ahead of what the vast majority of the financial advice space is doing. Sure, there's a few, a few now doing a similar kind of thing, but you're you're one of few, not one of many. Um, and I you know, guess congratulations to you and. And the rest of the team, particularly Steve, for for jumping on that and and getting everyone involved. As you said, you probably without without his push, without him saying this is the, this is the way forward, this is what we're doing, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have done it, and and you and you you know you probably wouldn't be in the same position that you are today. So, congratulations to you, congratulations to Steve and the rest of the group. You're uh, you're well and truly well and truly doing really well for it. Yeah, thanks, James. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. Yeah, there's no way I would have done all of this off my own back. It's only because the group that I'm with and the leaders there um, facilitated it and encouraged it, and were willing to pay for marketing consultants and things like that. That's the only reason this sort of this sort of started. But very, very glad we went down this path. So yeah, got the rewards for it now. That's it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Billy. Thanks for joining me this morning. I appreciate you jumping on the podcast. Good to chat with you, and I'll. Uh... And I'll see you at, a, at another financial planning event sometime soon. Absolutely. Thanks, James. Appreciate Thanks, it. Billy. See ya.